I'll use my microphone. How's that? Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> and I want to say um, welcome back because um, we haven't done events since uh, COVID. Actually, we did an event like within a couple days before things shut down for COVID. So we're happy to be back with some in-person events. We did some streaming events during the COVID season. My name is Ross Emmett. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty here at Arizona State University. Today's event is the first of three Perspectives in Economic Liberty public events that the center is going to host this semester. All three are sponsored by the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership in support of Skettle's new certificate program in philosophy, politics, and economics. The center's mission is to consider the contribution of economic liberty to human betterment. We pursue that mission through, in part, through the Doing Business North America project, which is a study of regulatory frameworks across North America and their impact on economic uh, activity. Um, we also uh, do things like today's lecture, and we also uh, issue some policy briefs that you can find on our website. Our speaker today, Ann Bradley, so notice I kept talking about me short. Um, and um, our speaker today, Ann Bradley, is an excellent person to invite to address today's topic, which is the paradox of democratic socialism. Ann is the George and Sally Mayer Fellow for Economic Education um, and the Fund for American Studies Vice President of Academic Affairs. Basically, she does lectures like this around across the country and also develops, delivers, and evaluates economics courses for the Fund for American Studies. She's also a professor at the Institute for World Politics and Grove City College. Hans Senholtz, a name known to people in the Austrian tradition, was a longtime professor at Grove City, and Peter Betke was a student there. So the, were you and Pete at all the same? No, that would, he's much older than you are. He's ancient, yeah, yeah. So he's as ancient as I am, so. <laughs> I first met Dr. Bradley through her service as Vice President of Economic Initiatives at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics while we were both at Acton Institute, uh, Acton University events. She often teaches the Principles of Economics course at Acton University, and she lectures for the Institute for Humane Studies and the Foundation for Economic Education. Before I turn things over to Anne, a word about our format. Anne will speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll turn to questions. Yeah. My, my other part of my uh, notes, yeah, it's probably there. Uh, so, no? OK. Um, at, at the, uh, at, during the Q&A, I will be um, ho um, monitoring, uh, like holding a microphone, and we'll move it around. So I'll give you a chance to, answer, to ask a question, and then I'll give Ann a chance to respond, respond while I take the microphone and then move around to someone else who wants to ask a question so that we have minimum in, in between time, we can make quickly and easily get the mic to, uh, to her for the next question. So um, Anne, welcome to Arizona State and also to the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty. And uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. Can you all hear me OK? Uh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, I've kind of done the Arizona tour. Um, so it's really a, uh, in one day um, to the extent that you can do that. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as Ross mentioned, this is um, a topic that I want to spend a little bit of time on. I'm going to open it up with some um, kind of just the economic way of thinking and how that can help us really wade through some of these important, timely, relevant policy debates uh, but before I do that, I just want to ask you to, if you're a student, can you raise your hand? Okay. Oh, great. So I have a good number of students. So I am here from the Fund for American Studies, as was mentioned. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit more about why I would be here, um, in addition to talking about these ideas, but to give you students a glimpse of some opportunities that we have. Uh, we are an educational institute located in Washington, D.C., and we bring students from around the country to Washington, D.C. for internships and learning opportunities uh, in the summer. 
And so at, at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those for professors in the room. Um, this is certainly something we would be happy if you would share with your students uh, if it's of interest. So I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, but again, these kind of ideas are things that we care deeply about at TFAS. Um, and so these kind of topics you might hear in a classroom over the summer. And so this idea of democratic socialism certainly seems, doesn't it, to have a lot of traction. Um, and I think it, it is gaining in popularity. And here's what I want us not to do. Uh, and I tell my students this too. On the first day of classes, I say, okay, I, I have you in my class for three hours a week for 15 weeks. Um, and what are in the summer for eight weeks. And what I want us to do is kind of put our economic thinking hats on every time you're in my class. And what I'm gonna kind of talk through a little bit at the beginning is kind of the micro foundations of thinking about how we make decisions, why economics is really the glasses, Pete Betke would, oh, would say that, right? They're the glasses by which we can get clarity. That's what glasses do, right? They sharpen our focus, they give us clarity, and they give us a framework for trying to understand complex problems. Normally though, what happens when you start talking about whether democratic socialism is a good idea, whether capitalism is a good idea, or whether some kind of mixed version of those two things is a good idea, people come right loaded with their opinions and they really hold those opinions really deeply, right? And so the problem, and you've probably been in one of these conversations, has anybody ever had a political or policy type of conversation with somebody you disagreed with? Yes. Have you ever done that to like two in the morning? If you're over 21 over beers, maybe, right? Okay. At the end of that, when you just like laid your heart and your intellect on the table, like for four hours, right? At the end of that, do most people say, you're right, I'm wrong. Thank you so much. I'm now going to go change my voter registration. You know, my, my bumper stickers are gone. I'm getting new ones, right? So usually what happens when we have these conversations, we just kind of get more ingrained in our own positions. Um, and what I want us to do is just let economics open up new questions for us, okay? And then we all have to decide how we feel about these things. But I think economics really brings to bear important realities, realities that are true about human, human nature, about the world, and we, any economic system, any political system, must reconcile with those realities. So before I get to some of those, let's just, I'm an economist, so we're gonna have a graph, of course. Um, and that's why we provide you with cookies and caffeine. So this is a great graph. Um, there's, there's graphs that are not so great. This is a good one. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit small to read, but basically when I, what I'm showing you is by all the ways that we measure poverty, which is very low levels of income, right? So these different colored lines are different metrics, $2 a day, $1 a day, $1.90 a day. So there's different, and there's debates and different things like that about what <clears throat> explains or what qualifies as extreme poverty. But by all of the definitions of extreme poverty, what has happened over the past 200 years is that it has drastically declined drastically declined, okay? I mean, it really, even in the last 50 years, 40 years, since the 1980s. So we're in this race out of poverty. And that's an exciting thing, right? It's an exciting thing. And I wanna talk about why. We don't wanna just get, you know, have money to have it. Money serves an important purpose for people. And one of those purposes is to give us choices, right? So when you have more income, you have more choices. This gives you more autonomy over your decisions. The less income you have, the more excluded you are from opportunities to outsource, and thus you must kind of produce. So when you're living at very high levels of poverty, right, you're not going to the grocery store, right? That's a luxury that's not afforded to you. So you're finding your different, much more costly and time inefficient, right, time heavy ways to get food, to produce food. So this is a remarkable thing that's happened, right? Running out of poverty won't solve all of our problems. I'm here to tell you that, even as an economist. But it's important. And so why, right? Why? Why is this the reality? What has happened? Okay? And if you think about in 1820, again, if you're looking at either $2 a day, which is the yellow line, or let's see, $1 a day, which is the red line, either 84 or 94% of the planet lives in abject poverty and people are dying 
young. And children don't make it past their fifth birthday. The human existence is immiserating, right? So income gives you a chance to escape some of that. So fast forward that to today. By the way, just one more thing. Johann Norberg, I encourage you if you're interested in this topic, he's a really important economist to listen to. He's a Swede, so he has a lot to say about Sweden's experiment with both more market-oriented reforms, but also more, um, you know, kind of socialist, if you will, reforms. And he did a book, in one of his book, many book projects, he kind of went out and surveyed people, and he just asked people, do you believe that poverty is increasing or de decreasing? And in one of the surveys that was conducted in his research, 95% of the people surveyed believed global poverty was increasing. So here's the thing. This is true for all of us. We can't make the world a better place, which most of us want to do, if we don't understand it as it is. So it's not just about our perceptions of the world, but we have to go. This is data that's easily available, right? So we have to first understand, well, what's already going on? These trends are happening. They're positive. They give us reason for optimism. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions, right? There's a lot of people who still live today that wake up our fellow human beings in poverty, in exploitative situations. So we need, there's a lot of work to do, okay? So I start with the note of, okay, things are kind of moving in some way in the right direction. But then the attitudes people have or the beliefs they hold are different. So let's switch gears for a minute. Here's another set of graphs. This is our results of Americans who are surveyed in 2019 about their attitudes towards capitalism and socialism, and it's broken down by generation. Okay, and so the dark green, they should have picked more contrasting colors, but the dark green is the percent of people who have a positive view of capitalism, all right? So this, this is the top line. And the lighter green is the people who have a positive um, experience or belief about socialism. And what do you see? It's, it's interesting. This is very clear generational divides in terms of people's attitudes about or willingness to entertain the idea of whether socialism is a good idea or whether capitalism is a better idea for, again, organizing economic affairs. So I'm going to get into definitions in a minute because I think that's really important, okay? So baby boomers, also here called traditionalists, okay? So in 2019, those are people who are uh, 55 and older. They have the most positive view of capitalism they have the most negative view of socialism, right? Younger generations, millennials and Gen Zers, it starts to converge here, right? So you have more positive attitudes about socialism as a way to govern an economy, as a way to govern economic affairs, and a decreasing view to some extent about whether capitalism is a good way to do the same thing. So that's what's going on in terms of attitudes, what people believe, what people think. I want to get in a little bit to why. Here's another survey that we found. 70% of millennials say they are likely to vote socialist. Red, extremely like likely. Yellow, somewhat. Uh, kind of this greenish, not likely at all. So here's the thing about surveys like this. It's one thing to ask someone if they're likely to do something. It's a different thing if they actually do it, right? So you kind of have to take these with that in mind. But we do have American politicians who are offering a kind of kinder, gentler socialism, if you will, right? A socialism that's democratic, that adjective in front of it is really important. And so the question that we have to ask as people who are putting the economics hats on, that's all I want us to do right now, is, is it a way to get better outcomes, to get greater advanced human well-being, to increase human flourishing, to raise standard of living, et cetera, et cetera? That's the question. We have to be, as people who are curious about the world and people who say they want to help the world, we have to be willing to engage in that intellectual discussion, right? So that's really important. I think sometimes we're not willing to do that. Um, and that's true for everyone, not just one political party. So what's, the, what's going on with democratic socialism, especially recently? Why are millennials and Gen Zers more interested in it? I think there's a couple things going on. It's just got a cool factor. Very frankly, here's the thing about it. It sounds very good on paper. The question is, does it get its, its stated outcomes? And that's what economics is about, because economics forces us to understand means and ends, right? What is the end? The end is greater living standards. The, great, the end is more equality. All these things are the end. 
is this the right means, the most appropriate means to our desired outcomes? That's what economics is about. And that is exciting, I think, because it means that as economists, we're able to put all the options on the table and make those assessments and then adjudicate you know, what are, what are, what kind of consequences unintended and otherwise are we going to get? So I think there's one thing, which is just, there's a cool factor, right? There's American politicians that are offering us a version of socialism that is not violent, that is not exploitative, right? Serious people are not advocating for a return to Stalin. They're not. So that's not what Sanders or AOC or anybody, that's not what they're saying. Let's go back to the gulag. They're not saying that. That's important. They're actually saying a modified version of socialism will avoid that. It can retain its democratic institutions, right? I think the other the kind of cool factor is just what goes on generally in marketing, right? So does anybody know who this is? Yeah, um, he was kind of a brutal dictator. But you can go to Urban Outfitters and buy a, a T-shirt with his face on it. So, you know, again, it, I'm not in marketing, so I'm not sure what the point of that is. But there are people that buy these t-shirts and wear the t-shirts. So the question is, you know, what is the cool factor? What are we trying to emulate? I don't have the answers to those questions. But I think this matters, right, for what people believe. And here's the other thing that I'm going to come back to in a few moments. We're going to do a little bit of economics first. But just kind of the Nordic model in general is positioned for us as an alternative, a third way, not ruthless capitalism, not violent Stalinism, not a socialism that leaves people hungry, that leaves grain to rot in the silos, but rather a socialism where people have pretty happy lives. If you look at the Nordic countries, there's lots of data. This is not hard data to come by. People are happy. They live long lives. They cooperate with each other. They're charitable. They start businesses. They go to school. They have high incomes. All the things we say we want, right? So maybe we should be more like Sweden. Maybe we should be more like Denmark. But what margins are we maximizing? That's what I want to talk about. So the first thing that economics does, I, I believe, if we do it well, is it forces us to add some nuance to our conversations, right? Take it out of the 2 a.m. fistfights, ideological fistfights, right? And then let's let the economic way of thinking guide us through these questions. So here's the thing about economics. I do this with all of my students. No matter what class I teach, I, I think we have to start here, which is I think economics is about how people make decisions under conditions of, of both scarcity and uncertainty, right? So you don't have all the information that you need to have to make decisions even about how to plan your day, let alone what are you going to do for a living when you graduate from college, right? Or what are you going to do, you know, where are you going to move when you get your first job or where are you going to retire, right? So we don't have all the information. We're not supercomputers who can wade through all the information and come up with the perfect choice, but we have limited knowledge and we have scarcity, right? So Adam Smith, I think, in my opinion, has a legacy as kind of the founder of modern economics, even though he was a moral philosopher, why was he kind of his legacy is as an economist, or he, he brought some really important economic insights to the table. And I think the reason is because he understood human nature well. This is one of his more important points, is kind of some of the articulations that he provides over the realities of human nature. And here are some of them. Here's the thing, humans are humans, right? So the same people that populate government populate hedge funds, populate, you know, work in nursing homes, work in charitable organizations, and run churches. People are people. So there's no heaven on earth. There's no utopia possible. So when anybody promises you an economic or political or legal system that will guarantee utopia, you know that that's not right because of the human factor, right? So what is the human factor, human nature? We are... <clears throat> I mean, we have reason, we have agency, right? We want dignity, and we want that dignity to be protected, right? We want to live free of violence and coercion, but we're limited. The other thing about human beings is that they're creative. So I think Julian Simon was an economist who, and I'll come back to him a little bit later, uh, but really brought this um, kind of very much to the forefront that human beings have everything they need to be the problem solvers, right? 
Human beings are the source to solve the problems that we face in the world today. But they need to be incentivized, right? They need to have the right kind of framework in society so that they can go out there and solve problems, right? So what does Adam, he recognizes these things, the finite nature of people. Right? We can't, here's another way to think about it. You can't thrive alone. Has anybody ever seen the movie Castaway? So I always used to make my micro students watch that movie and then we'd talk about all the economics that were in there. Which is right, how professors make something that's fun into something that's not fun by making it an assignment, right? But the Castaway is a great story of how we were not meant to be alone. We cannot thrive alone, right? So Tom Hanks is this federal exe exe FedEx executive, excuse me. He, takes a cargo plane on Christmas Eve after he's proposed to his girlfriend. She says, yes, life is great. Except then the plane crashes, right? And the plane crashes on this remote island, which would be beautiful to vacation to if there was a hotel and a restaurant and an airport. But he has none of those things. So the FedEx packages are floating around. And he makes friends with a bloody volleyball that has a bloody handprint on it. Named, named, its name is Wilson. And it's like the most desperate part of the movie is when he loses Wilson on his raft. It's devastating. We can't be alone. We're social. So we have to find a society that induces that sociality. But it's got to be peaceful, right? Because if it's not peaceful, then what's going to happen? The person with the most force wins. And they get to tell the rest of us what to do, right? So I think it's a great movie that exposes our vulnerabilities alone, right? So we're limited, but we're also self-interested. That's another really important point that Smith brings to the table, right? And so his concept of self-interest is not, um, it doesn't preclude sacrifice. It doesn't mean that we can never do something nice. We can never share. We can never sacrifice, right? I have kids. If you have kids, have you ever done something for them that you didn't really, it was a sacrifice you maybe didn't want to do, right? Have you ever done something for your parents, sacrifice or siblings maybe you didn't want to do? right? So we're capable of that, but here's the distinction. We don't operate in an altruistic way all the time. Why am I talking about this? What does it have to do with economics? Because again, the institutions that we live in, the institutions that we ask for, have to be predicated on these realities. You can't change human nature with policy, right? So how are we going to take that self-interest and funnel it to the public good. Is there a way? He thought there was a way, okay? So what Smith talks about is not appealing to people's selflessness, but actually appealing to their self-love. He talks famously about the butcher and the baker and the brewer, and he says, we don't appeal to their selflessness. We actually appeal to their self-love, right? So think about you go to the butcher, you beg for your dinner. That might work one time. But the butcher can't remain a butcher, right, if he's or she is giving something away for free all the time. So how do you take those countervailing interests of consumers and sellers and align them? He says it's possible. And for Smith, private property rights are the key. Private property rights are an institution of society that induce us to think about the needs of others. Because think about it, if you have a private property right that's protected, then what do you have a new incentive to do? Think about how to use that private property in the most productive way. What is the most productive way? Well, it depends. What do people need in your society, right? Are you, what are you gonna do with that asset? It could be land, it could be money in the bank, it could be a resource. Your job now is to think about the needs of others and to try to fill them. And only then do you make a profit, right? The butcher has to bring the meat to the table before you give the butcher any money for it. So Adam Smith realized that we don't have to have a society that manipulates human nature because it's impossible to do that, right? But rather we can have a society that meets people where they are. Adam Smith described people as sometimes good, sometimes bad, sometimes smart, more often stupid. <laughs> Right? So the idea here is that we know a little bit about a few things and we're ignorant about a lot of things. So what does that mean? We have to find ways to cooperate. Right? But we can't rely on just, you know, kind of a sharing or an altruistic mentality. 
So again, these are really important premises before we have any big conversations about socialism, capitalism, or some mix of the two. So what are the economic realities that we face? Because they're there too, right? So if you kind of have taken physics, um, I, I took physics in high school and I haven't looked back, so I couldn't tell you much about physics, but here's what I know is gravity is my reality. So if I walk off the top of this building, I'm going to fall. <laughs> so therefore, I should probably not walk off the top of tall buildings, you're right, to protect myself. Or if I'm going to do that, I need to insulate myself from gravity, which is going to propel me downward, and I'm going to get hurt. Right? So we don't have to understand the technical aspects of gravity. You don't have to know the equation. But if you don't respect it, you do so at your peril, right? Same with economic realities. They are there, and we need to understand them. And again, social, political, economic, religious institutions have to reckon themselves with these realities. They're non-negotiable. So what are they? One, we live in a world of scarcity. The most scarce resource that you have is your time. It's the most scarce. So even billionaires have to worry about how to get all the things they need to get done in 24 hours. And none of us knows how many days that we have. So time is your most precious asset, right? Again, why do economists care about income growth? I mentioned that at the first slide. Because income allows you to overcome some of these costs that scarcity imposes upon you, OK? Our resources are mul have multiple and competing ends. And what that means is that like the, the, the loggers who are in South Carolina that are going to wake up to morning, uh, tomorrow morning and cut down trees, those trees can be a multitude of consumer products. But once you decide the trees are going to be a podium, they can't also be printer paper, right? So you need a lot of trees to satisfy the competing ends of all the consumer products, right? So in the system, well, I'm going to get to this in a minute, but that's where we're going to start to talk about economic systems. Which systems respect the constraints that we're talking about best? It's always a question for economists as relative to what. So we're not ever talking about perfect. It's not on the table, right? So another um, kind of economic reality that's really important is that incentives matter. People do things for reasons. They are purposeful, even if we don't like their reasons even if their reasons are wrong, right, or unethical or immoral. So just a side note here, uh, I was in graduate school at George Mason University when 9-11 happened. And I got an opportunity with a professor I was working with at the time to write a paper with him, and I ended up writing my entire dissertation on Al-Qaeda. And my entire dissertation is predicated on the idea that the people who run Al-Qaeda, the people that join Al-Qaeda, the people that do all these horrendous, terrible things are rational, they respond to incentives, and we need to think about them that way, right? Which means what? Under a different set of incentives, they might not do it as much or as often, right? So that's how economists think about human behavior. So we have to, firms need incentives, right? To discover, to innovate, to create new technology. There has to be a reason. There has to be a payoff. There has to be a benefit. And consumers, it's the same thing, right? Why do you shop where you shop, whether it's Amazon or a farmer's market or anywhere in between? You're responding to the incentives that you face in the way that best satisfies your needs. And then the other idea here that I think is really important, and it goes back to the Tom Hanks story, is that we're each limited, right? So you have limited gifts, skills, and abilities. And it's your job. You're, many of you in the room are college students. That's why you're a college student, right? Because you're starting to engage in specialization. What is my major? How do I get better? How do I help my, you know, help my intellect develop, my critical thinking, my practical skills? You're going to do this for the rest of your life, even if you never go to school again after this, right? Some of you might go to graduate school. Some of you might start working. You're going to be a lifelong learner, right? You're going to get better. You're going to improve. You're going to specialize. And what we want is for that to be associated with your income going up, right? And in a, in a society where the, the firms have to compete against each other to hire you, that's exactly what happens. As you become more specialized, right, you have the possibility to earn a higher income. So high incomes come because people are becoming more productive. And that is because the trade they engaged in is based on fine-tuning their comparative advantages. So, so Tom Hanks on the island can't do that, can he? 
I mean, you should go watch it again, right? It's like painstaking to watch him rub two sticks together, get a fire. And he almost doesn't do it, and you think he's just going to end it all. And then he finally does it, and he's like running around screaming, I made fire, because it's a big day for him. He made fire. I couldn't make fire, right? You might be able to do that if you're a Boy Scout. This is like if you're a hobbyist, you go camping. But his life depends on it. So life, it's very hard to survive each day for him. Why? Because he has to do it all on his own. He can't outsource, right? So economics helps us understand about this process of coming into markets to engage in commerce, because what does that commerce allow us to do? Rely on each other to do things we're not good at, right? Here's another really important point, and I'm building up the micro foundations, and then we're going to talk about these different economic systems. We have a knowledge problem. We have a scarcity problem in terms of time, but also in terms of knowledge. And so I think it's a really important point that when we think about how economies work, right? How many tomatoes are grown in the US this year? How many ears of corn do we need? How many pacemakers should we produce next year? What new innovations need to occur? Nobody sits outside the economy and decides that. Because the economy is not the product of someone's mind. The economy is rather the product or the amalgamation of lots of individuals negotiating, trading, buying, selling, refraining from buying. What you refrain from buying tells entrepreneurs just as much as what you buy, right? Because they want you to shop with them. So the optimal allocation of resources cannot be known prior to engaging in exchange. This is an economic reality. How many tomatoes should be grown in the United States next year? We can make a pretty good guess based on what we've done this year and the year before and the year before. But as long as there's any amount of change, right, in people's feelings towards tomatoes and what we learn about their health benefits or not benefits, we don't know, right? So we need to learn. So we have to have some type of economic system that incentivizes learning but respects scarcity. Because that's the fundamental element here, right? Scarcity means we have to worry about running out of things and satisfying as much demand as we can. So that's a tall order, right? So we're going to need the right set of economic systems. So let's compare markets, or capitalism, if you will, and socialism. So I think that this debate gets off the rails really early because people come to the table with preconceived lots of kind of um, baggage around these phrases, right? Like capitalism, what does that mean? Some, for some people it means like you love people who are greedy and run hedge funds or something, right? It's like a caricature of something. Or socialism, what does that mean? Like you're a hippie and I, you know, wanna share, I mean, what does it mean? It's meaningless. So we use these as insults and we hurl them at people who hold views that we don't agree with. That's not helpful. <laughs> That does not get us to what is the best economic system for higher living standards, greater consumption, longer lives, happier lives, egalitarian benefits of consumption. That's the, that's the stuff we're trying to maximize. So I want to kind of give it a, a more of a technical um, analysis or, or set of definitions around this, right? So a market economy is one where there's private ownership. We, we say of the means of production, right? So individuals protected by private property rights own things, and then they make allocation decisions and production decisions and investment decisions about the, the stuff that they own, right? But individuals that live within the context of a system that includes government, right, that protects those private property rights. Socialism is public or collective ownership of the means of production. So we, uh, and these are the pure forms, all right? Democratic socialism is going to be a bridge, but I want to set the terms because I think when we're just, oh, you're a socialist, oh, you're a capitalist, we're not even, I don't even know if we know what we're saying, right? And so I don't think that advances this debate or gets us to the right answer, which is what this is supposed to help with. So public ownership of the means of production. So we have to collectively own things which means in its pure form, we have to not have private property rights. And then what does that mean? We have to appoint someone who can make decisions about them, right? When you own what's in your bank account, you make decisions about what's in there. If someone else owns your bank account, or if we all own your bank account, 
then we have to appoint someone or a group of people who are going to make allocation and production and investment decisions about those resources, right? So we have to think about how does that change the decision-making process? How does that change the incentives, et cetera? Right? So in a socialist economy, the decisions about ownership and production are more centralized. They have to come from the top because we have collectivized the ownership, right? So you're not deciding. There's a committee or a group who decides, and then they tell you this is what the group has decided and you have to go do it, right? Whereas in markets, those are more decentralized. So they often happen on the production side through firms, right? So Apple is a firm. As a firm, it makes decisions about how to maximize profits over some certain amount of time, right? They don't have perfect knowledge. They don't have perfect insight. They have to figure it out. And there's a lot at stake if they mess up, right? So they bear the cost of being wrong, right? So the costs of being wrong fall more closely to the people who have made the decisions than in a centralized system. You know, if, if a Soviet manager, for example, in an extreme example of collectivization, makes a bad decision or a wrong decision about how much wheat to extract from the fields to make bread, does that bureaucratic manager pay the price for being wrong? No. They just come up with a new quota for next year or next month or next week, right? So there's not consequences for good stewardship. Because here's the thing. Stewardship is the name of the game. We have scarce resources, and they have lots of demands on them. So we have to figure out how to use them wisely, prudentially, and find ways to grow them, right? F find ways to make things more abundant. That's the name of the game. It's not easy, of course. And the long track record of history, look, remember the graph I just showed you. We've lived in poverty, exploitation, and kind of poor health for most of human history. So this kind of escape out of it is pretty new. In markets, how is knowledge transmitted? from buyer to seller. Because think about it, in a very decentralized economy, you're not, you can't know everybody you interact with. I mean, think about the last time you went to the grocery store. How many people do you know that work there? Now, you might know a cashier that you go through their aisle all the time, or they work, you know, you go at the same time and they work the same shift. But you don't really know them, right? You haven't sat down and interviewed them about how the grocery store is doing X, Y, or Z, right? And why not? Because the, the process of the market allows you to not have to do that. Right? And so prices are conveying information about changes in scarcity very quickly. Very, very quickly. They're nimble because they're decentralized. Okay? With the, with the absence of private property rights, then you don't have market prices. Okay? You have to come up with some other mechanism. So, for example, again, extreme example in the Soviet Union, there were just arbitrary prices. They were just made up. Right? So I encourage you, if you're interested in this, uh, Thomas Sowell's book, Basic Economics, in chapter two, I think, on prices, he actually has a translation of a book written by two Soviet economists who um, lived through, um, you know, kind of all the different five-year plans, or many of them, and they talk about the pressure that was put on them to come up with prices, and it was impossible. They had millions and millions of prices, and that people are calling all the time, we have a shortage here, we have a surplus here, move the price, change the price, right? No two human beings or no 20 human beings, no matter how many PhDs they have, are able to do that because that's not what economists are equipped to do. We don't know what, the, what future prices should be. We can't, some of that is out of the scope of what we can know and control, right? And so managers then are the middlemen in a non-market collectivized economy, and that's the way we're gonna transfer information, right? It's much less effective because it doesn't have the same power of a market price which itself is decentralized. So I wanna say another thing too, because I don't think we should, you know, I'm an economist, we think a lot about commerce, markets, exchange, commercial exchange, but I think there's kind of a broader tapestry of institutions that we live in that are worth considering. Again, any economic or political, uh, governance set of institutions uh, needs to think about all the spheres of our lives, right? So the market is about exchange, like I said, commerce, buying and selling, right? The state, what does the state have that the market doesn't? It has the, the monopoly of force. That's necessary, right? Markets can't do everything. So don't, you heard it here, 
right? Like markets can't do everything. So they can do a lot of things. The goal here is to figure out what this should look like, what this interaction, this interwoven tapestry should look like, right? Markets should be left to do things they're good at, right? And the state should be left to do things that it has a comparative advantage in doing. And civil society is quite important for a lot of the way we spend our lives. How many people as students here are in a student club? sorority, fraternity, how many people have been a member of a community organization, a church, right? This is civil society. It's part of where you spend your life, right? They all matter. So here's the thing that matters a lot for this, for where I'm going with democratic socialism or capitalism or just straight up communism, if you want to talk about that, right? There's what I, the, the claim I'm making here is that each of these spheres has an important role or function but it needs to remain allocated to that function. And what happens in pure collectivization, think about the Soviet economy, pure collectivization, what happens? The state swallows the other spheres, right? Because it starts to dictate what happens here, what happens here, and it can do that, why? Because it has the power of force. So then you actually lose these robust sectors of society. So one of the things we always have to be worried as kind of political economists about is power. How many people are worried about power? Just on some level, right? You're worried about an American president having too much power. Are you worried about a congressman having too much power? Are you worried about the leader of a country having too much power? Most of us have some natural fears about power because, right, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if you read the founders, right, James Madison I think is excellent here, his famous quote about men not being angels. Why does that matter? Well, men aren't angels, so they need constraints, right? They need boundaries, they need limitations, tort law, things like that, right? But then you put non-angels in charge of governing non-angels. That's a problem, right? So what do you have to do? Constrain the government, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a healthy fear of the one sector that has the ability to dominate force getting too big. So this is a, a human problem, right? There's nothing really new about it. But let's go back to the data. I want to show you another graph that's showing some similar things. It's kind of a, a, a other side of the coin from what I just showed you. This is one of my favorites. So this is global GDP <laughs> over modern human history. So there's lots of stuff going on in this graph. And a bunch of different economists have over time tried to measure this. As you can imagine, it's not easy to measure GDP. By the way, gross domestic product is what GDP is, right? Final goods and services produced in a country in a year. This gives us kind of a sense of what people can consume. That's why we measure it. It's a kind of a proxy for income, if you will, okay? So it's not really easy to measure GDP in AD 1000 because we're not, we don't have access to tax returns, right? Um, but the good news is that men, many of the economists who've looked at this have kind of come up with about the same ranges, doing lots of different archaeological and different types of work to try to estimate this. And what we know, what the, what the, the, the estimates show us is that for most of human history, people have lived at pretty much zero income, one to three dollars per person per day. So very low per capita incomes, very low, okay? Also with very high mortality rates. So it's very hard to survive to your fifth birthday, right? Uh, even in the 1800s, it was about 25% uh, death rate prior to your fifth birthday. So it takes a long time to get out of this, right? So this is a very slow kind of process, right? It takes us till past 1900 to cross $1,000 per person per year, right? So we're very poor. And what are the social institutions? Expropriation, slavery, empires that did not, you know, kind of build their foundations on political liberalism, right? Civil rights, that type of thing. So there's episodes of wealth, but it's not egalitarian, right? The, the benefits of those wealth are kept closed off to much of the population. Look at this. World population graph over the same time period. Look at this. It's just hovering over zero, right? You can't get off ground zero because it's so hard to keep people alive. So the problem here is keeping people alive when they're young. You know what the modern problem is? Keeping people alive as they're older, 
that's kind of cool, isn't it? Right? Like we just want to kind of live forever and ever and ever and ever. Let's hope we can, right? As much as possible. So it's a different set of health, infrastructure, medical, all sorts of problems. But here, you're trying to keep them alive, right? You're trying to keep them to survive past their early birthdays. Here, we're trying to extend life as long as possible. So I want to go back to the point I made earlier about Julian Simon. Here's what he said. He said, look, we don't need to worry about excessive population, which comes up sometimes in this conversation, not necessarily particular to democratic socialism, but when we start to think about growing wealth over the whole globe, people get worried. You know, can we all be billionaires? Are we going to run out of stuff? You know, maybe we should depopulate or reduce the world's population. But what Julian Simon says is, look, people are good for the planet because they're the problem solvers. But what do they need? They need the institutions of economic freedom. That's what they need. Economic freedom is the answer. So what, how does this all interface with kind of the question of democratic socialism? I show this graph to my, or this picture to my students, uh, the, you know, kind of at the beginning of the semester, and we talk a lot about this very ordinary experience for you, right? So the last time you went to your grocery store, it probably looks something like this, and it's mundane. Maybe you even dread the errand. Right? But there are fellow human beings on the earth today don't even have this as a dream. Because a dream has to be something you believe can happen, right? It has to have a picture. But for us, it's ordinary, right? But the order of this, how this got here, is defined through the process of the market economy, right? So the market economy has some robust outcomes that we want to preserve. And so the question is can democratic socialism uh, preserve those outcomes? I'm going to hurry because I have. Um, I'm running out of time. OK, so I'm going to end on kind of some, some of these notes and then open it up for questions and then talk a little bit about more about TFAS too. So kind of what I set up as the beginning, more people are convinced that democratic socialism is a third way, right? Serious people do not believe we should go back to Stalin or Mao. So that's silly, right? They're just going to take that off the table. So the real question is, is the Nord, are the Nordic countries a model of successful democratic socialism? I think that's one question. And another question is, should we do more of that? Should the United States adopt it? Should other more kind of supposed capitalist economies adopt more socialism and mix it with democracy? Well, my answer to you is going to be that I think if you look at the world, we have lots of awesome data. We live in a world of lots of data. And we have lots of ways to measure the economic environment that people live in and whether it's successfully sets individuals in that economy up for advancing their living standards, social cooperation, all the things we talked about. So this is a map of what we measure. It's called economic freedom. Okay, So when we look at economic freedom, we measure a couple of things. We measure the soundness of the currency, the levels of regulation. Right. So we're not it's not saying you know, you can never have any regulation. It's asking a much more thoughtful question. How much regulation is good in what industry? How much is too much? Right? We need to get deep in nuance with our questions. It's not all or nothing. Uh, the the um, attitude or, or the foreign trade, kind of the freedom and openness to foreign trade, we're looking at the government consumption, right? How much does government spend? Why would we look at that? Because government has to get it res its resources from other sectors. Right? So government is dependent on other sectors for its ability to consume. And we look at the protection of property rights and things like that. So the usual suspects, the countries that are most free, right? Western Europe, Australia, United States. Uh, these kind of green is called mostly free. Uh, orange is mostly unfree. And red is least free. So the question is, if you live in the least free parts of the world, what type of government do you have? If you live in the most free parts of the world, what type of government do you have? And where does democratic socialism fit into that? I'm going to pause here and talk about a hypothesis that comes up between two Nobel laureates in the 20th century, Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek. This is known as the Hayek-Friedman hypothesis. And here's what they both individually hypothesized. And there's been papers written to empirically test this. Their suggestion is this, if you want democracy, you have to have a market economy first. You have to have something that approximates a market economy in order to get stable and lasting democracy. That's kind of shocking, right? It means that there's, and, and what they say, it's, it's even more nuanced. You have economic freedom is a necessary but not sufficient condition, meaning you have to have it to get political liberalism, i.e. democracy, but just because you have economic freedom does not guarantee that outcome. 
So if that's the case, how can that tell us something about how economic freedom fits in with democratic socialism and whether the Nordic model is, is really an approximation of that? And so my argument is going to be, if you want, and that the, I just think the evidence is very clear on a lot of this. Now, there's certainly gray areas about how much government involvement in different industries is going to be successful or not successful. Those are open, ongoing research questions that I think are important. But the big kind of takeaway here is look at these. This is, sorry, this is, a, I had to zoom in so I couldn't even catch all the countries, but Let's look at, this is economic freedom, these are the best countries. So let's look at the countries that are typically classified today as democratic socialist Nordic model. Denmark is number five in economic freedom. Uh, let's see. The Netherlands is 17, and I had to look it up because I cut it off, but Sweden is number 33. So these are countries that are characterized by high levels of economic freedom, which means what? They are not socialist. They are not socialist. Why? Because they don't have government ownership of the means of production, right? Sweden actually had a very explicit experiment with socialism from the 70s to the 90s, right? Collectivization of certain industry, things like this, and it brought their economy down. It was when they liberalized that they got economic growth, okay? So, the countries that are usually portrayed as let's be more like Denmark, I actually don't disagree with that, or let's be more like Sweden. Do you know what Sweden has, though? School choice through vouchers. So the question to me is some of the people who are advocating for democratic socialism also don't hold the opinion that we should open up and privatize school choice through vouchers or privatize Social Security or cut inheritance taxes. So if we're going to be more like Sweden in particular, we have to do those things. So Sweden is a lot more economically free than it is socialist. What does Sweden have that is very different than the United States? A very expansive social safety net. That doesn't make it socialist. So again, the nuance in the definitions is important. So what have the people in Sweden agreed to? Very high tax rates to support that. So Johan Norberg, I mentioned him before. This is what he says. He says you can either have big government or you can tax the rich. You can't have both. And what Sweden has demonstrated is that the entire population pays the taxes. So the notion that often I hear American politicians saying, which is that we'll fund a version of democratic socialism in the United States by taxing billionaires is not financially sound. Not only will that not fund the programs like zero price education or daycare or things like that, but it will also reduce business incentives. So for example, in the 70s, the I Swedish company Ikea, Ikea moved out of Sweden and moved their operations to the Netherlands because of the, you know, kind of increase towards socialism and the government policies at the time, right? So you will slow down innovation and you'll reduce the attractiveness of businesses to come to your country. The other thing we know for sure is that, you know, it, it's, the Nordic models are some of the most innovative economies in the world. Compare that to Cuba. Compare that to modern day Venezuela. Compare that to Soviet Russia. We have lots of empirical evidence of the efficacy of pure collectivization. Pure collectivization doesn't get you dynamic, innovative economies where people want to be, right? It actually gets you an economy where people want to leave. People are trying to exit Venezuela, not enter. People were trying to leave the Soviet Union, not go there. There's reasons for that. Now, communism is over here. It's the extreme form of collectivization. That's, again, not what we're talking about. But I think the extremes are necessary to show you how the different economies work and how people behave in those economies. What kind of behavior are you going to get under these two systems? So to sum up, I think democratic socialism is just not a stable equilibrium. I think if you have a democracy and you have a thriving economy, and you decide to collectivize that economy, you will lose democracy. So violence and authoritarianism, that's a feature, not a bug, of collectivization, right? So that's just kind of the outcomes that we have. So I think there's a, I'm gonna stop here because I wanna take questions and comments, but I think there's a lot more we can talk about other than democratic socialism. For example, like how much regulation is necessary in the financial sector? I don't have all the answers to those questions, but I think talking about regulating a sector of the economy is not the same as socialism. 
So we need to stick to the definitions and have a debate on those grounds so that we can really, I think, get to the right answer about what is the pathway to a better world. Um, so just for a moment, if you'll bear with me, I want to talk a little bit more about TFAS, and then if it's OK, we'll open up to questions. I'll just take a few minutes. So we would love to have you come to Washington with us if you're a student. Even if you're about to graduate, um, you would still be eligible to come spend your summer with us. So think about, instead of studying abroad, you study in Washington, DC. So these programs are really great if you want to do policy work, if you want to do think tank work. I mean, you can't throw a baseball without hitting a think tank in Washington, DC. Lots of, uh, of our students work on the Hill. So if you're interested in politics, if you're interested in journalism, there's just really great opportunities. And so it starts at the beginning of June. Uh, you take at least one class, um, and then it ends. There's graduation at the end of July. We work very carefully to place you with an intern opportunity that aligns as best as possible with your interests. And so you're going to take classes at George Mason University from me or other professors at George Mason University. We have policy classes, international trade classes, all different types of things. And our goal is to make this um, part of your overall educational um, development plan. So those classes are picked especially so that they transfer back here towards your degree requirements. And so we wanna really utilize your time uh, extremely well. We have lots of fun stuff we do too. And we do on go on tours and go to baseball games and all sorts of stuff. So if you're interested, I'll stick around after. My colleague, Laura, Laura, if you want to raise your hand, she also can answer any questions. And we have uh, designated full scholarships for Arizona students. So if you're really interested, make sure you talk to us because um, we have some special scholarships and, and full scholarships, which would alleviate the cost of the program for you. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll do questions. OK. Thank you very much. We have um, time for some questions. And we always start with questions from students first. So if students have, yeah, professors have to wait till the end. <laughs> they get to talk other times. <laughs> so I will um, please, after you answer the, ask your question, please uh, hand me back the microphone. Hi, I'm a uh, Gage Beveridge. I'm a TA here. Hi. I uh, do math stuff. So uh, you mentioned cool. a couple of times uh, that a socialist economy is necessarily going to be centrally planned, but that's not really true. So there are some models of socialism that are decentralized. For example, you could take an anarcho-syndicalist approach where the economy is built from the bottom up, uh, where distribution and production of resources and goods are handled at a local level by democratically elected councils of workers. But my point is, to get to the question, do you have any critiques that pertain to decentralized models of socialism? I mean, I, th I take your point. I, I think the, the bottom line here is, is how do you enforce, say you can do that, right? And then you can be successful of it, the, uh, with it. I, I mean, the question is, how are you gonna maintain it over time? So without the three Ps, prices, property rights, profits, and losses. The question is, is how are you going to make effective resource allocation decisions? How do we know they're going to be the right ones? So if we can decentralize, so you're kind of talking about a model where you'd have decentralized but still power, right? In this case, would we have market prices in your view? Or not market prices? Because if we don't have market prices, then the way we're going to allocate resource decisions is going to be arbitrary. It's just going to be arbitrary. And so the problem is the incentive system breaks down for people to maintain that production. So I don't see out in a, on a largely social scale how it's maintained without force. So I, I, I'm going to give another example for a moment. So Deirdre McCloskey, who's an economist I think everybody should read. She's amazing. And she thinks a lot about some of this stuff. And here's what she says. She says she thinks part of the interest in socialism is because according to her, we're born into socialism, which is the family. And I had to think about that, and I'm like, you're right. You know, It's like my parents didn't make me buy my cereal from them. They gave it to me, right? They told me what I could have. They told me what I couldn't have. They told me when I could do things, and they punished me when I didn't do what they wanted. It was completely arbitrary. They're, they were the power holders, right? 
So we kind of do have this kind of affinity that it can work. But the problem is we can't just be one big family because what my parents have is love. <laughs> they love me. And so even when they like mess up, they want to correct it. They have an incentive to try to get it right, even though they're imperfect and fallen and they can't do that very well. Right. So I think that's the thing that has to be addressed no matter what system we use. If we're going to do away with markets, if we're going to do away with a mechanism that tells us how to do what and when and when we need to change. The thing that replaces it, if it's anything other than arbitrary, you know, I don't know how that works. And so if it is arbitrary, then you're going to have to use some amount of force to get the outcomes you want. So that, that's kind of the way I think about it. But I think, you know, McCloskey's vision of like, why are we, why do we want to believe this? I'm not saying that's where you are coming from, but I think some people are coming from that. Like we want to believe that we can extend what works in our little social circles into the broad social circles. And, you know, again, 330 million people, 340 million people in America, whatever the number is, there, it would be impossible to figure that out. Um, it, it would be hard for, it's hard for me to dictate the lives of my two children. So, well, anyway. Yeah, another question in the back? Hi, I'm uh, Jacob Foley. I'm one of Professor Emmett's students. Thanks for coming. Thanks for um, having me. I'm naive, so I may have misheard you, but I believe you said that um, some of the, the Nordic countries have a tax rate that is across the board the same for different tax brackets. Is that correct? So, well, what Sweden has done is that, so a lot of their taxes are consumption taxes, right? So the poor are going to pay that in the same way that the rich are. And what kind of my point there was you can't finance what the Swedes want to do with social welfare by only taxing rich people in Sweden because there's not enough rich people to tax to get the money to fund daycare, education, college, all the things. So if you want to have a large welfare state, I guess the point here is you can have a large welfare state and maintain democracy, but you have to have the political will to make it happen. And that happens through taxation. Okay. Right. So that's kind of the bigger point, I think. Yeah. So my that leads me to my question is like, would you, does, would you agree that the, a dollar earned for someone, uh, in the, like a middle income bracket has the same marginal revenue or sorry, um, like, uh, reward as a dollar that like a billionaire earns, you know, does that worth the same to those two different people giving like the decreasing, uh, marginal value or whatever? I mean, it's really hard for me to know. Right, what people think about like if I earn ten dollars, is that going to be worth the same to me as if like you know Elon Musk earns ten dollars? Yeah, I don't know, right? probably it, it, not, but I don't know because I can't understand their utility functions in that way. Okay, so never mind then. No, 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 <laughs> keep going. I'm not trying to shut so, you down. So, I'm, just, what, what, what I'm getting know. to, I don't know how Elon Musk, how happy he is by his marginal. A rich dollar. person, it's then. less it's someone who earns but, more money. Right, if you're if you're impoverished, if you make two dollars a day, yeah, and then you start making four dollars a day, you're doubling your income. Yeah, that's a huge gain. And it's a huge increase in your consumption possibilities, but it's still not enough, right? So certainly your point is it's diminishing utility right. of the dollar. Of course it's true, but like I can't actually speak to how they feel about it. Okay, yeah, not not them in specifically, but then um, I guess uh, I was just getting towards if you advocate for progressive tax systems. Yeah, if I personally do. Yeah. Well, see, here's the thing. It's like what 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 does that look like, and where where does the progressivism stop, right? So. I want, as an economist, to think about what type of nexus of economic and political systems has the most egalitarian benefits. That's really important, right? Because your point, I think, is what you were getting at. is like, Elon Musk bought Twitter for fun. I mean, I don't even know what that means. Like, I don't have a billion, you know, right? Like, it's just like, this is what I, I'm going to do this thing. And maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. We'll have to see. We don't know, right? But if you're a, a single parent with multiple children and you're trying to balance, do I get to send my kids to daycare or do I pay my doctor's bill or my car got off? Those are real constraints that Americans face, okay? So I think those are important for us to think about. But what I want to think about is what type of economic system extends the most benefits to the most people as possible that doesn't just reward wealthy people, right? And so centrally planned systems reward people that are in the political machine, right? That's how you get on top, is you just become a member of the political class, and then you're guaranteed to eat better than everybody else. But if you live in a market-based economy, 
right? I just, I'm writing an essay right now about the contrasting lives of um, Gorbachev and Queen Elizabeth who were born five years apart and died nine days apart. And they lived over almost a century, had radically different personal experiences. And you know, one of the things I was writing as I was thinking about how remarkable this is, is that when Queen Elizabeth died, she probably had the same cell phone as I do. I'm not cradle to grave royalty. I'm an ordinary person and nobody knows me, right? Like I'm not important in terms of the world. And I have the same cell phone as a queen. That's remarkable because when she was born, no matter her royal status, she couldn't own a cell phone because they didn't exist, right? So this, this progressive cheapening of goods and services that becomes available to everybody is really the outcomes that we want, right? Because what does that do? It allows people to outsource. So that's what I want from my economic system. When I'm thinking as an economist, what are we trying to maximize here, right? Broadly, I would say it's human flourishing, but that's kind of hard to quantify, right? So I think when we look at economic freedom, we actually get a map of the infrastructure that's either going to allow people to thrive or hold them back. Good question. Um, it's tough too, right? No, 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 no. It's good. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Bill Zipper, just a uh, citizen. Uh, very nice talk, and I just have a, a quick comment. If anybody's interested in the Sweden question, your uh, Johan Norberg mm -hmm. has YouTube videos that are just fabulous, yeah. and he goes over this at great length and with quite a bit of humor. Uh, he, he's a he's a very good speaker. Yeah, um, I, here's the thing. I really think that we should, uh, what I like about him and admire about him is he's just an optimist where it's appropriate. And I think we have lost optimism. I, I don't know why. Another thing Deirdre McCloskey says all the time, she's like, I need to start writing books with like doomsday titles because people buy those books. And she's right, but she's like, it's an amazing time to be alive and nobody buys that book, right? It is an amazing time to be alive. That does not mean that we don't have real problems to solve, but he's excellent at saying, look, this is the good, this is the bad, this is the ugly, let's embrace the good and let's extend it to more people so we get rid of the bad and the ugly as much as we can, right? So I agree with you. Um, my name's Rachel, I Rachel. am a student here. Um, you said that violence and authoritarian is a feature, not a bug, and that made me curious about the violence and the authoritarianism that we experience in our society here. What is it like? 39 mass shootings and we're only on the 25th or 26th day. Yeah. So how do we yeah. make those things match? Yeah, that's like, a, how do we correlate that? That is an important question. Um, and I think it's a growing problem um, that has to be taken very seriously. And so I, I, I guess probably I'm not qualified to talk about why we're having more shootings. You know, I don't I don't know what the if there's one cause or multiple causes or if it's that we're ignoring mental health or if it's it's a lot. Of, it could be a lot of things. Right. Um, but one thing I know for sure is that if you look at the data on countries that have lots of economic freedom, this is also to, it seems to me kind of somewhat of an American problem. Right. Um, it's not that it doesn't exist other places. Homicide is a real thing, but talk about mass shootings. Also, another problem we're having is, is increased suicide rates, especially in young people. And so we have social cultural problems. As I mentioned before, I don't think markets can solve everything, right? So I think there's other non-market approaches to these problems, which is community, neighborliness. You know, how do those, how do we kind of ignite those elements of our society to help solve the problems? But I don't, I mean, my gut reaction isn't more economic freedom makes us shoot people more. Um, and I don't have any evidence that would say those two things go together. Now, I would be happy to, to research the question more. But I mean, I just want to say I agree with you that it's a problem. Um, but here's the thing, too. If you look at completely collectivized society, like in the extreme versions, um, it, human immiseration on every margin, death, famine, um, I recommend a book. It's so hard to read. It's called Secret Ghosts, Mao's, uh, or Hungry Ghosts, Mao's Secret Famine. And it's basically a story about cannibalism, right? So like, look, death and destruction and despair was the status quo for most of human history. We might not have had AK-47s, but we were killing each other, right? And we, and we were dying young of disease and all. The violence was the norm. I think violence is much less the norm. That doesn't make your point not a point. It's relevant, and I think it needs to be addressed. What the, all the answers are, I don't, I don't have those. But I'm not sure there's a cause and effect story between economic freedom and 
suicide or mass shootings. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi again. My name is Sabrina Garland. Uh, I had a question for you on your opinion about the rise of like the trend of shareholder capitalism and how it seems now to be still in the theoretical phase, but I've seen some firms talking about wanting to embrace it more. And I think the way that I interpret it is it seems unintentionally to be in a good way, you know, giving workers the, the means of production without wanting to, you know, <laughs> make that parallel sort of what Marx talks about, but in a way that seems friendly still to capitalism and mm -hmm. then also incentivizing worker motivation to then increase the quality of the output of the firm. Yeah. So what do you think about that in that American context? Yeah. I mean, look, I think that it's really important for me to say here that I think that firms should be able to experiment with what they want. And you have to see what works and what doesn't work. And so, you know, I, I think sometimes behind this notion of shareholder capitalism is that somehow prior to now, we have ignored everyone but the bottom line, which benefits, right, um, quarterly earnings and the board. Um, but here's the thing at the end of the day. Let's go back to the cell phone, okay? Um, I am immensely well off with having a cell phone versus not having a cell phone. Like, it allows me to do an inordinate amount of things, right? So I, it would be very hard for me to give that up. Um, and so this kind of notion that, you know, prior to, to the recent past, these innovations are only padding bottom lines and not kind of benefiting consumers, I don't think is correct. But that said, you know, I think that getting workers more involved in the final output, getting them to be more productive, getting them to be more engaged in what the firm is trying to do is what entrepreneurship is about. And I absolutely believe that firms should have the freedom to experiment as long as they can't, you know, violate your rights and force you to do things that you don't want to do. So I think the chips fall where they fall with that, right? We're going to see how it all plays out. Um, but I, I don't buy the idea that like just up until recently, firms were only kind of benefiting this one small group of people um, and then the customers were somehow kind of like left in the dark. And I think us sitting here with all the creature comforts that we have is a testament to that, right? The cell phone, internet access, all these types of things um, available to us through the work of firms who again, um, this is an important part of markets, the firm does all the work before they sell one thing. Right, so think about the first iPad, which was that like 13 years ago, or I don't know, somewhere around there. This didn't really exist before. It's kind of a new innovation. It's not a laptop, it's not a phone, it's, not a, it's kind of like this product that's in the middle of that space, right? And so they do focus groups, they spend millions of dollars, they hire engineers, they do all these things. They spend all this money, and then they say, okay, we're ready, customer, here you go, right? And then it's like, fingers crossed, hope we, you know, like hope they like it because we're all, we're out of all this money. Now they don't do that whimsically. They put a lot of thought into it. This is not also a comment on like firms are, you know, wearing capes and are superheroes either, right? These are all people who are capable of greed, um, malice. They're all self-interested. So those truths always hold. But um, I, I just really think when you think about the way entrepreneurship works in a country like the United States or a country like Sweden, the onus of everything is on the entrepreneur. And then they get a dollar. And then hopefully they get more dollars, but we have to like it, right? And in the iPad situation, people like the iPad so much, they had to kind of produce some overtime to fulfill the, the demand. People are like, I want this thing, it's great, right? So, but that's not always the story, is it? So firms, it's profit and loss that we care about in a market economy. So it's not just firms making a profit, but in the market economy, there's a decentralized disciplining mechanism, which is the loss, right? So if a business goes under, it's because they couldn't deliver to people what they wanted at a price they're willing to pay relative to other alternatives. That's important because it's disciplining the firm to stay focused on the problem solving, focused on the customer, right? Again, it's not perfect, but I think that's been a characteristic of firms in market economies, it's this like long, ugly process of doing it. It's a struggle, right? We don't know, firms don't know, um, but it's always, it, it theor at least kind of in theory, right? The goal is I need to give the customers what they want because that's how I get paid. And so I don't think there's anything new about that if markets are allowed to function appropriately. Hi, Hi. Um, I wanna ask you a question. 
Why do you think there's such problem with communicating to the general public the benefits of capitalism? Um, because often I hear like, let's say I'm on TikTok or Instagram or things. All I see is like, yeah, dude, the reason why you're poor or broke is because of capitalism. And the only way we can solve it is if the government gives you money. Um, but yet we see when you look at the talk, which, by the way, you did a great job communicating the benefits of capitalism. But when we look at graphs and we look at these things, it seems like these things are never communicated to the general public and that we can't actually are often not communicated, mm -hmm. but we often see the worst aspects yeah. of society and not the benefits. Why do you think that is? And what's one way we can solve it? Yeah, those are important questions. I think, um, how can we solve it? I think we need to talk and learn, the talk about economics and talk about what economics, just very simple introductory economics brings to this analysis, right? So again, what I like to do is say, in my classroom with my students, any discussion is on the table and you never have to agree with me. <laughs> but what I'm gonna hold you accountable to is can you think like an economist? Can you employ these assumptions? Can you employ this way of thinking and apply it to this issue? And then you ultimately get to decide. That's a disarming thing. But most people in the world today, the way we kind of engage and the way we enter conversations is like our feathers are ruffled, right? So I have a, a whole long kind of series of thoughts about why that's it. I'll spare you from a lot of them, but I think some of it is just the way we engage. You mentioned TikTok. Like I'm so old, I don't have TikTok. However, right, like I have Twitter and Twitter is a, like a really easy way to be mean to people. It's just like, bing, you know, you're like a keyboard warrior, 186 characters or whatever it is. And then you're like, you're stupid, take that. And then you hide behind it, right? And then you never have to confront anybody again. And so it kind of, I think the virtue of debate, dialogue, it's okay if people don't agree with you. Why is that a bad thing? Why do we need people to deeply agree? I mean, you want to be right. I understand that, right? But I think our civil dialogue is eroding. And I think that we pit people who we care, you know, we create caricatures of like, what does it mean to be, you know, a socialist or what does it mean to be a capitalist and then we demonize what we don't like so i think one is econ more economics education everybody go read tom sowell everybody like this is easy thing to do and entertaining and interesting and you'll learn a lot and then i think be willing to debate people who don't agree with you and also not villainize them so important right so those are kind of easy on paper hard to implement in reality but i think yours is such a great question so important Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, like, increasingly in modern times, there's a, uh, you know, there's a contrast between polarizing views. Like, for example, even though the poverty has gone down, but there is a growing difference between the rich and those at the bottom. Uh, or when we talk about political views, there's more polarization, you know, be it through yeah. Twitter or anything. And now, so when we uh, before the talk, when I thought about democratic socialism, I thought it was like the best of two worlds where we try to come in the middle. But now when we talk about the view that that is not possible. So what is, is it the nature of the system to go towards the extremes? Mm -hmm. Is there no safe middle ground mm -hmm. in any system, economic or political of yeah. any nature? Yeah. Because everywhere we see political or economic, there's a growing divide, right? We are not coming close in any sense. Yeah, so I think that if the institutions of economic freedom have to be, we have to be vigilant around them. And what I mean by that is that economic freedom of a country can rise or it can fall, right? So think about Venezuela. It was the richest country in Latin America 40 years ago. And it had the highest economic freedom score. Today, it is a disaster. I mean, it is a humanitarian disaster. And people can't leave fast enough. I mean, it is devastating, right? It's devastating. And so the, the tragedy of this is it didn't have to happen, right? But it's the pursuit of specific policies with ideals that are not possible and sustainable. They can be possible in the short term. You can finance socialism for a time, but it, you can't finance it forever. And so that model doesn't work. So I think that we have to, again, bring economic reasoning into this conversation. But your point about polarization, which is similar to the other point that was just raised, I think is important. And your kind of question of, does it always go to the extremes? And here's, this is gonna be very unpopular maybe, but I think politics is, should be like the least important thing we do. People think it's the most important thing. It's like the most, I live right outside of Washington, DC. This is all anybody ever talks about. 
I'm like, I don't know what bill you're talking about, right? Like we don't watch the news in our house. Like that is, I recommend that highly. You will live a happier life. Don't watch the news. So maybe get off Twitter. And I don't know. I kind of like Twitter, but it's like, you got to be careful, right? It's like, it's like drinking too much or something. You don't want to do that. So don't watch the news because what do people do? If you watch Fox News, that's all you watch. If you watch CNN, that's all you watch. And you live in an echo chamber. And we live in a 24 hour bombarding your face every two seconds with this, that. So Brian Kaplan is an economist at George Mason University, just wrote a really great Substack. I don't know if you read it on this. And he's like, I'm happy because I don't watch the news. I read what I think is important. Like, so he follows the news, but he doesn't get caught up in the echo chamber of hyper drama. And, and kind of one of his points is that the news only reports like the rarest events. And so we start to believe their routine. Right? Like you don't hear a news report that 23,000 flights landed safely today, which happens every day. But you hear about like one crash. And so you think planes are crashing. We need to do something with these crazy airlines, right? So it informs your perspective of the world. So I do think there's a tendency, especially living in the digital age, which I wouldn't throw away, but I think we have to be cautious about like, what are we inputting into our brains all the time? So if it's constant, a constant echo chamber, then it's much easier to treat this person disagrees with me, so they're the enemy. What does that do in politics? Whoa, it just, you know, kind of increases the noise. And so everything becomes political, right? The other thing I'll say too, as the state gets bigger, the stakes are higher. The stakes are higher for losing as the state grows in size and scope. And so then everything becomes politicized and that becomes a problem, right? So we're fighting about things that we wouldn't have thought about before if they were problems that we solved in another sphere. So it's also really an important question. I think one we need to take very seriously. So thank you. Hello, thank you. I um, really appreciated your talk. Sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was really intrigued to uh, see so many of those Nordic countries so high on the uh, economic freedom scale. Yeah. I'm curious to go look in later and see sort of what, what sorts of policies uh, feed into that because that's not the narrative one usually hears on those countries. Um, I was also really curious uh, and intrigued to see them so high on the innovation scale. Um, so I'm wondering if you could perhaps share a little, uh, are there particular policies in those countries, maybe policies that you hear less about that uh, particularly contribute to their innovation? Uh, and if so, would those be policies that uh, could potentially be models for yeah. things here in the States? Yeah, I mean, so we can always learn lessons from economic freedom success. And, and right, so there's, there's usually we're not talking about this country does everything right, so let's emulate it. I also think that's kind of a, um, an overly simplified way to look at the problem. So I like your approach, which is like, what are the specific things that lead to more innovation? And so one of the things that economic freedom can help us understand is just kind of the level of regulation. So this will often, so when we look at economic freedom, in particular, they look at uh, regulation of credit, regulation of labor, right? L regulation of businesses. So we can look at, you know, um, do you have to have a license to operate some type of business. This is a growing problem in the United States, less of a problem in Sweden. And so, and to give an example in the United States, I mean, there's many, unfortunately, um, but one that has particularly started to get some attention is um, occupational licensing, in particular around hair braiding, right? So hair braiding is done usually in someone's home, no chemicals, no scissors. So it's very hard from a regulatory approach to say, there's a real public health threat here, a public safety threat, right? Like you could cut my ear off or you could put too much, you know, chemicals in my hair and burn my skin. No. And so, uh, you know, kind of the more research we do there is that we see you can look at it by state too. In some states like Louisiana, for example, has an enormous amount of requirements for a person to braid hair in their own home. I want you to think about the economic and social effects of that. So basically we're talking about an African-American woman usually who's working in her home to make money for her family. I call this micro entrepreneurship, right? She doesn't have a brick and mortar. It's like, I'm gonna take care of my family. I have this skill, I'm gonna make some money and this is what I'm gonna do. And so when we raise the requirements for being able to do that, what do we do? We cut off the opportunity. And so in Louisiana, it's, I forget, but it's like hundreds of hours of cosmetology school 
that you have to qual that you have to complete to be able to braid hair in your own house. So what does that do? If you think about economic mobility as a ladder, this cuts off the bottom of the ladder. So now I have to reach higher and jump harder and I can't get there. And who are the people that are agitating for this? Salons. Because a salon in your town doesn't want you doing hair for half the price at your kitchen table because they're paying rent, they're paying employees, they're paying health insurance, right? All these things. So it's just a very specific example. But you can, there's just absolute tons of research on this. Um, Matt Mitchell has written a great book called The Pathology of Privilege, where he looks a lot at occupational licensing and just different elements of kind of what we're now calling, you know, we've typically called rent seeking, but we call cronyism, right? And so I think this is more of a problem and a growing problem in the United States. But if, if you have a less interventionist regulatory state, then you're going to have the ease of doing business is going to go up, right? It's easier to open a business. It's easier to maintain the business, et cetera. So that's one explicit example where Sweden has different requirements than, and it's industry by industry, right? So you could spend all day kind of um, looking at some of this data, but I think it's a real problem because I think, again, we want to think about how to open up um, the levees of, of human creativity, right? We want to make it easy for people to solve problems of other people. We want to make that easy, not difficult. And so an overly burdensome regulatory regime is going to protect those that already have privilege, protect those that have enough money to hire lawyers to go down to K Street, if it's we're talking about Washington, right, to lobby for that, those privileges. And I think that's a very damaging thing if you care about this egalitarian kind of um, wealth creation and, and the increase in living standards. So yeah, that's, that's I mean, there's lots to look at there, but that's one. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Joe, I'm with the New College. Um, getting on the note of uh, violence and authoritarianism. Yes. I, you know, we kind of just spent 20 years at war. We spent like three times the amount as we did on the Marshall Plan in Iraq and Afghanistan, yep. have nothing to show for it except a giant migration crisis. And then also, you know, Comparing like the Nordic countries with, you know, Venezuela versus Cuba, are, are we kind of overlooking the history of colonialism, the history of imperialism, the grocery list of military interventions, covert actions, death squads? Oh, sure. I mean, I, I personally, I feel like the biggest uh, paradox of democratic socialism is um, you have Augusto Pinochet roll in and throw people into torture camps. So what is, you know, it, I, I, I'm not sure how I can phrase it. I mean, do we think that this feature of authoritarianism and violence that we see in Cuba, you know, or Venezuela, I mean, we could talk about the, you know, cocaine habits of uh, Hugo Chavez, yeah. you know, the, the failure to diversify the economy, having a resource curse of oil. I mean, we, we, I mean, look at the, you know, violence in, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, you know, we have systems of slave, la slave labor building, you know, it, it, I, I think you see where I'm getting at. I think I, I think I understand. I guess what I'll say is, and tell me if I'm not answering your question or, or responding to your, to your comments. Um, I, your point is well taken about U.S. interventions around the world, especially the kind of the perpetual war economy, right? Um, if, you're, if you're interested in this, Chris Coyne at George Mason has just put out a new book. It's called In Search of Monsters to Destroy, and the title says it all, right? So this is just kind of a never-ending cash cow. Um, and so the incentives are to kind of fight wars endlessly because it pays military industrial contracts really well, right? So some of that is going to show up if we look at economic the economic freedom index, of course. That, so that would allow us to kind of use that framework to think about the trajectory of these economies. I mean, so I think that's something that is not without consideration. The other thing I'll mention is that I really like, I didn't have time to bring it up today, but it's called the Human Freedom Index. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's done by the Cato Institute. So they take the five pillars of economic freedom and then they bring in maybe six or seven other really important qualifiers because the criticism of using economic freedom as the metric of kind of the openness of the society is that it doesn't really tap into everything we care about, some of which you're talking about. 
And so some of the things they measure, which would be scored very poorly in a country like Saudi Arabia, is freedom of association, freedom of identity, freedom like can you marry who you want? Um, do you get religious persecution? Can you move where you want? So we don't think about that, right? Like I can move to California and I don't have to ask permission. I have to be able to afford it. So I have a constraint, but I don't have to ask. But if you live in Saudi Arabia, you're a woman, there's a lot of things you can't do. But the Economic Freedom Report alone wouldn't pick that up. So they're trying to get better at bringing this more robust picture, which I think will incorporate some of those types of things. So, but to get to your bigger point, I think you're right. Look, I think the United States is a mixed economy. It is not a panacea of capitalism. It's not. So we can call it that if we want, but I think that's wrong. And I think the data show that that's wrong. So the United States could do a lot of things better than it does. It could regulate less. It could engage in more or less. It could, you know, a lot of things it could do better. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, that as our data gets better, we're going to get a better picture of how to actually measure that, right? But I think in some ways that's different from a question of are we collectivizing the economy and what are the consequences? So I think the bigger question of democratic socialism is can you have both a market economy, right? Or can you have democracy, but can you collectivize large sections of the economy and keep it from going into internal, you know, yeah, falling apart? Um, so your point's well taken. I think we're getting better at trying to measure this, but yeah, um, good question. I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Awesome. This is going to be the last question for the Okay. Event. Sweet. Thanks. Um, my name's Dakota. I'm a staff member on campus. So I agree that I do think capitalism did a good job of having more opportunities for people because I, like, I agree with the charts. Like It's crazy to see how much we've gone from you know 1300s. But I think one thing that is a concern that I've seen is how do you uh, justify the consolidation of all these mega corporations, of all these smaller corporations that are actually under the umbrella of bigger ones? Yeah. And is that actually breeding innovation if they're the ones that control everything and that push their own agendas? It just can feel a little concerning that how am I supposed to trust that, you know, Kellogg has the best interest of me if they own everything that I consume or, you know, Monsanto with the, yeah. you know, all the, um, you know, pesticides and the, the farming and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it's a great question as well. And so kind of I think what's kind of behind your question maybe is is how pervasive or, you know, maybe monopolistic or oligopolistic practices in kind of modern American business. And if it's a problem, what do we do about it, right? So I don't think per se being large means you're a monopoly, right? It could have to do with a lot of technical things in economics, including your fixed costs or all sorts of things. And so there's a reason that Walmart is big, right? They have these huge economies of scale and so your, your Cheerios are cheap, right, for example. Um, that doesn't mean that they are like eating up other businesses. And business consolidation is again, a natural part of firm experimentation. That can either be a good decision or a bad decision. The thing about market economies is this, mistakes don't tend to be systematic and they tend to be easily corrected because if a consolidation is a bad decision, that firm is gonna have to do something different or dissolve, right? It's, I have more of a problem as an economist with when the state provides benefits, perks, subsidies, favors one form of industry over another form of an industry under the name of whatever, whether it's military industrial contracts, solar power, wind power, it could be any, pick anything, because then what we're doing is we're picking winners and losers. And so if you're not on the winning side, it's hard to compete with Goliath because the state sanctification through cash is what creates the Goliath. So I actually think that's the way to kind of retract some of these problems that are real. So I don't think it's just big as bad. I think it's actually more about what is, again, the regulatory, the subsidies, what, what's going on in these different industries, how concentrated are they and why? What's the reason for the concentration? Because that then will help us understand what do we do about it? Do we need antitrust legislation to solve it? Or do we actually just need to stop subsidizing X, Y, or Z? Or do we need to subsidize something more? Like these are open questions that economists should say, okay, I'm going to take the matrix of economic thinking and apply it to that so I can try to come up with what the best you know, possible decisions are. So I know that's like not an answer to your question because it's not like do this one thing, but I think you have to be really kind of careful about what are we looking at? You know, Is Google big for a different reason than Amazon's big for a different reason than Walmart's big and why? And part of that is just gonna be industry specific and have nothing to do with monopoly power. 
but it could be state-sanctioned monopoly power, which is generally bad, right? Because it creates these winners and losers. We want to avoid that. Thank you. Let's uh, thank Anne for thank her time. You. Since since I have you as a captive audience for a minute or two, I just want to point out two products of the Center for the Study of Economic Liberty that are relevant to what we've just been talking about. One is a report that we produce every year called the Doing Business North America Report, which is a report that looks at the regulatory systems in cities across the United States that enhance or can um, create problems for, uh, the, the, for business startups and for businesses that are um, already already functioning. I also want to point out that we have a, on, on our website, we have a, um, a state licensing hairdresser salon board ranking uh, of that, that a, a former policy analyst for us did that ranks um, the, the licensing board for hair salons on economic freedom sort of rankings to the extent to which they're controlled, for example. In many states, they're actually, you can only be on the board if you are a salon, right? So it, it's a protection of the salon industry. So you might be interested in that, but uh, others can find that on our website as well as the DBNA report. Thank you.